We already gave Metro Exodus the full run through for graphics analysis and looking at RTX on versus off, high versus ultra. You can check our other video on that, but what we haven't published yet other than today is the benchmark performance. So today we're looking at a lot of performance characteristics of Metro Exodus. This is wide reaching. We look at DX11 versus DX12 scaling. How do they perform versus one another? We look at DX12 scaling across multiple settings, like with the 2080 Ti. We look at built-in benchmark versus in-game and manual benchmarking and which one is sort of more reliable. And then we're also talking about RTX scaling across all current RTX compatible 20 series devices. So that's our roundup for today's benchmarks with Metro Exodus. And let's get started with the built-in versus the in-game benchmark. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA CLC280 liquid cooler. People ask me how I keep cool during the summer with all this hair. Well, I've tried a lot of different products and few do exactly what I need. Many of them cause tangles or worse. EVGA CLC280 helps keep my core temperatures low during hot benchmarking sessions. The CLC280 is price competitive and focuses on performance for value, offering a 280 liquid cooler at an affordable price. Get yours at the link in the description below. Hair mounting kit sold separately. Getting into this one, so we noticed a couple of really important things here that should be pointed out first. You have to restart between all changes in Metro Exodus. It does have some issues with applying those changes. This is really not abnormal for game testing, but Metro Exodus in particular, it has some, some odd performance behaviors if you don't restart between even resolution changes sometimes. So this isn't 100% of the time there, but the randomness of the performance anomalies, and by anomalies I mean sometimes it'll hard lock to 60 FPS, and it's just, it's not because of VSync, you can force VSync off in global settings and NVCP, whatever, doesn't matter. Sometimes it'll just hard lock and there's no fix for it. And that can be from not restarting between changes, it can be from other things too that are less obvious, like having desktop resolution or monitor resolution different from game resolution. So if you have an FPS lock, that might be it. It can be from uh, scaling and windows, stuff like that. So it's got some weird bugs and quirks in there. And then separately, we did have issues with the benchmark occasionally locking to an odd 62.5 FPS, very specific number that was resolved by walking away and coming back later. So we're not sure why that got fixed, but it did. So this, this already was off to a start where there's that kind of benchmark anxiety of, can I even trust my numbers? Because I don't know if I can trust the game. We got it to a point where we trust it. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell you how we got it there. It just, it took a lot of just weird troubleshooting effort and one of the things worked. So anyway, that's what we're looking at. Also, the first benchmark run is often inaccurate. It scores lower than the rest. We'll talk about that today too. So let's, uh, let's start off here with that built-in versus in-game testing and show the differences between the two. One of the most important things to look at with major game launches is whether the built-in benchmark is actually reliable. With Final Fantasy, we discovered that the game had improperly called objects to the extent that they affected performance from miles away, horribly inaccurate to actual gameplay. With other games like Civ 6, we found that the turn time benchmarks are actually pretty realistic to gameplay. For Metro Exodus, we'll start by checking actual in-game performance versus the benchmark scene. We're starting with only the 2080 Ti at 4K resolution, scaling across low to extreme settings, and with varying RTX configurations. We found that the built-in benchmark operated at only 84 FPS average with the 2080 Ti at 4K and low settings, with RTX off, mind you, whereas our in-game testing posed a 152 FPS average performance results. Pretty big difference there. As always, this is tested multiple times in average for parity, and these numbers are, are very consistent at this point. At medium settings with RTX off, we found performance to decay to 72 FPS average for the built-in test, and 118 FPS average for the actual gameplay. This further drops to 60 FPS average for high settings with the built-in benchmark, and 94 FPS average for the in-game test. For the next data point, we have to highlight something important. With ultra settings and RTX off, we're still at 87 FPS average, which is technically better than the built-in benchmark's 84 FPS average at low settings. So you can kind of draw a visual line there from one to the next and see how big of a hit there is for running the benchmark versus actual gameplay. If ever there were any question as to whether the built-in benchmark is an accurate depiction of gameplay, this answers it by three entire drops in graphics quality settings. 
For extreme settings, we hit 70 FPS average without any RTX enabled, and 40 FPS with all graphics settings completely maxed. You'll see that at the end of the chart. But as we descend in between those two, we eventually see that the RTX 2080 Ti hits 53 FPS average with RTX on high, and graphics set to ultra with in-game performance, versus 36 for the built-in test. We then hit 48 FPS average with RTX Ultra, a drop about 9% from high, and we show the differences between high and ultra visually and qualitatively in our previous content piece, but we'll show some of those as refreshers here. And uh, on average, the differences are minimal between high and ultra, but you do have about a 9% hit. So all of that sets the scale for us. We'll show some more footage from our qualitative comparison while explaining some of this. As for what it all means, it's pretty straightforward. As long as the card-to-card -card scaling remains equally spaced in the built-in test as it is in the game, for example, a 2080 Ti retains X percent lead over a Radeon 7 in both tests, where X does not change, then it is acceptable as a synthetic gauge of performance. It is not, however, useful as an absolute gauge of performance for this game. So anyone wanting to play Metro Exodus specifically should be looking at in-game benchmarks, not the built-in benchmark. It is you'll end up buying something way higher end than you actually need. And you might not even think it's possible to get what you need if you look at the in-game benchmarks instead. For comparing two cards relative to each other, though, the built-in test is still useful. It just comes down to having equidistant relative scaling between devices. As long as that exists, you can use it as a synthetic comparison. It's functionally time spy or fire strike at this point. So useful insofar as determining the distance from one card to the next as a percentage, but not as an absolute FPS value. So we're going to stick with the in-game Game testing for the rest of our work because it's more universally accurate and let's look at some more detailed performance numbers next. Except for this one, all tests in our benchmark today are with DirectX 12 enabled as it's required for DXR. We still wanted to test DX11 though as sometimes game developers will lazily wrap the more abstracted API or fail to really leverage DX12. Worst case is we see some performance loss. For this one, we took the RTX 2080 non-TI XC Ultra and tested it at 1440p in Ultra settings with RTX again disabled. We still aren't heavily loading the CPU here, so this is very much a GPU-bound benchmark. With DX11, we measured performance at 114 FPS average, 91 FPS 1% low, and 89 FPS 0.1% lows. The DirectX 12 in-game test put us at 112 FPS average, 84 1% lows, and 79 FPS 0.1% lows. That's more or less tied, but we need to look at frame times to better determine if we're operating outside of variance. As always, frame time plots show us frame to frame present intervals to get the best picture of per second experience of gameplay. Lower is better in frame time, but consistency is more important than just being lower. For this one, we see that DirectX 12 testing plots us at starting around 8 milliseconds, then climbs to around 10 milliseconds, eventually hits 12 millisecond frame times. The more important aspect is that the spikiness of the frame times measured swings more than DirectX 11 does, as you can see here. These are both completely playable, and the frame time variance never exceeds 8 milliseconds with DX12 enabled, which means that the average user really won't know the difference. DX11, to be fair, does have tighter frame time consistency and is objectively better. It's just that when it comes down to it, the objective superiority doesn't really matter in this context. It's measurable, but it's not perceivable to the end user. 4A seems to have roughly equal performance in DX12 and DX11, maybe slightly favoring DX11 on average. Now that we've whittled down testing to just focusing on DirectX 12, we can look at graphic settings and RTX scaling more granularly. For in-game testing, performance scaling from the 2080 Ti at 4K shows reasonably strong results at 4K Ultra with RTX off, giving us an 87 FPS average. This grants high settings with RTX off a gain of about 7 to 8% against ultra settings, or ultra a gain of about 25% against extreme settings. We think that Ultra is the best middle ground on average, at least for higher-ish end devices, considering that Extreme shows severe performance fall off. Medium is another major step, where there's a severe change from medium to high, but texture and shadow quality really start to become noticeably bad with medium settings. For Ultra settings with RTX off, our 87 FPS average is 65% higher than Ultra settings with RTX on, its lowest setting, which NVIDIA calls high, presumably because NVIDIA does not want to dirty its brand with an option named low, even though it's basically low and high in this case. If you prefer to look at it the other way, it's about a 40% performance drop from RTX off, and going to Ultra drags us down an additional 8% from RTX high, rendering even in-game frame rates undesirable. The impact of RTX appears to minimally be about 40% 
FPS at loss to 45% loss at ultra. As for what that gets you, again, we'll show some of our footage from our previous technical analysis of the graphics quality, where I was joined by Andrew on our team to talk about the qualitative look at the game's visuals. The end result is that some scenes, particularly those outside where light bounces off snow for a less faked global illumination, we get additional contrast to more gradual shadow gradients like across the chest of one of the characters on the front of the train for instance and in other scenes like the actual namesake metro of the game metro exodus there is functionally zero impact from rtx and visuals to the point that it's just confused you almost wonder if it's broken because there's still a 40 to 50 percent hit to frame rate in exchange for nothing you can learn more about the visual appearance differences in our previous video on the channel, and of course subscribe if we do any follow-ups. But let's move on to another test. A quick note before progressing further. We noticed that the first run of a benchmark would produce numbers sometimes 8 to 10 FPS lower than subsequent benchmark runs, and this is for in-game testing. So uh, these mostly average out when considering multi-pass test approaches, but just be aware that your first exposure to a new area may be at a lower frame rate than repeated or prolonged exposures to those areas. The numbers that have been on the screen now sort of demonstrate that, where we can see a bit of performance fall off on that first run and then some corrections uh, shortly after that. This doesn't always happen, but it happens probably about 90 plus percent of the time. RTX only testing is next. For this, because we're specifically looking at RTX scaling card to card, the charts will be limited to only compatible 20 series devices. At 1080p Ultra, with RTX set to high, because Ultra just seems kind of pointless, the 2080 Ti tops the chart at 138 FPS average, with lows at 99 FPS and 94 FPS, 1% and 0.1%. These are good numbers overall and reasonably consistent, so frame time pacing isn't suffering here. That said, compared to RTX off numbers, we are still obviously taking a large performance hit. The 2080 non-TI ends up at 114 FPS average, allowing the 2080 Ti a lead of 21% and leading the RTX 2070's 90 FPS average by 26.6%. The 2070 then leads the 2060's 80 FPS average by 13%. This gap is much less impressive than the previous two, and considering our review of the RTX 2060, we know that an overclocked 2060 could somewhat easily catch the stock 2070 performance. Granted, you could also overclock the 2070, but it's not hard to get baseline stock performance out of an overclocked 2060. 1440p is next. For these settings, the RTX 2080 Ti FE ends up at 101 FPS average, posting a loss of about 13% from the previous chart. Lows are still tightly timed, and within reason, the RTX 2080 runs at 77 FPS average, granting the 2080 Ti a lead of 32%. This impressive gap should widen as resolution continues to increase. The 2070 ends up at 60 FPS average, and the 2060 isn't far behind, demonstrating significant value when considered against the 2070. Again, a quick overclock would balance things here, but the distance between a 2060 OC and a 2070 is much less than a 2070 OC and a 2080. Keep in mind further that dropping settings to high from Ultra for the preset, not for the RTX preset, would give us some performance back, although RTX is responsible for eradicating the majority of frame rate. The last chart is almost embarrassingly barren, but to be fair, it's really not our fault. At some level, notably below 30 FPS, it sort of stops becoming pertinent to test the lower end video cards. At 4K Ultra and with RTX set to high, the RTX 2080 Ti leads the 2080 by about 36%. This again expands its lead as the RTX 2080 begins to fall behind from the sheer pixel throughput, but both devices are struggling in the face of RTX enablement. Still, it's far more playable than the pre-built benchmark scenes, Dropping settings would make this a bit easier, but it'd make the most sense to just disable RTX altogether if in desperate need of a higher FPS at 4K. For example, a 2080 is perfectly capable of 4K with a reasonable FPS in this game. You would just have to turn RTX off. For this game, the graphics difference qualitatively, there is a pretty significant difference. And I speak about this with Andrew in our other video where we look at the graphics quality, visual quality, is there a noticeable difference, a perceivable difference in the game when you toggle RTX on versus off? So for high versus ultra, ultra versus off, there's really not that much of a difference. There is about a 10% performance hit by going from high to ultra. You can see the difference if you really look at it, 
But at some point, if you have to be sitting there with your face three inches away from the monitor, looking at each quadrant of the screen to find the difference, the difference is irrelevant. So for that reason, we would generally suggest, if you want to use RTX, going with high instead of ultra and just taking the extra frames, because that's going to be worth more to you than the often imperceivable differences of ultra. Now, again, they do exist, but it's at a level where if you're actually genuinely playing the game, which we weren't, we were looking for these differences, you're probably not on average going to notice. So that's the first item of note. The second one is that in some scenarios in the game, like again, the Metro we talked about, the actual Metro, it's uncommon to see these differences materialize, but the performance difference does materialize. So where you won't notice any visual impact, you will notice a frame rate impact to the tune of about a 65% improvement with RTX disabled, or if you prefer to calculate it the other direction because stat math is funny and sometimes misleading, it's about a 40% reduction from the uh, baseline off. So you weigh it how you want, depending on how you want to make the numbers look, I guess. But that's what you're working with. But that's not the only type of experience in the game, the Metro, of course. There were significant visual differences in sort of the overworld, like the train hub level, where you've got the ray bounces off of the snow, they hit characters, and if you don't know what RTX Global Illumination is, well, that's what the toggle does when you enable RTX in this particular game. It's the first implementation of RTX GI. Global Illumination is most commonly showcased, as it was with NVIDIA's presentation, by using sort of multicolored objects within a room. Maybe you have a, a big area like above it and you can get some uh, sort of like color casting where when the light shines down on the objects or on a wall or whatever you'll get almost a, a radiative glow off of the object or the wall and we'll show some footage of one of those just to illustrate what it does and and uh, what you're looking at so that would be a global illumination demonstration that's what you get with metro and it does some other things too like again bouncing rays off the snow to illuminate the underside of things or to illuminate characters where normally you would have to sort of fake the graphics by putting in maybe a, a hidden or an invisible light source on one side of the train, for instance, to create the illusion of global illumination without the cost of really doing it in a real way. So RTX is an interesting way for developers to achieve global illumination or other effects without putting in manual effort. Is it worth it? Well, most of the audience is still playing without RTX. Even if you own the cards, you might drop it for performance. So it'll be a while before we see this really widespread, and a lot of developers will probably, on average, still be using those the cheats. And that's really what game graphics is. It's all about cheating the graphics to make it look as real as possible, because uh, if you went for true realism, it's just not going to be something you can render in real time. So RTX finds a, a middle ground there, and sometimes it works incredibly well, like in some of the outside scenes. Sometimes it's completely nebulous and up for debate, like inside the train or actually at the front of the train, Personally speaking, subjectively, I preferred RTX off. I thought it looked better. Now, that might be because I'm trained to looking at games the way they're made today on average, but I thought it looked better, so I would turn it off. And then there are other places where it's just it's a very clear there's no benefit, like in the Metro. So there are three very specific scenarios of uh, objectively just superior and then completely subjective you might not like it and then there's no value at all and because of that mix of things plus the performance we're seeing uh, we wouldn't necessarily let me rephrase that we would not recommend buying an RTX card just because you want to use RTX yet now if this starts to become more widespread if it doesn't become another abandoned Nvidia technology it may well be worth it if you're a developer if you're someone in graphics if you're in 3d art there's a whole host of reasons you could argue RTX is worth it but if you're a gamer then Metro on its own is not really a good enough reason but either way you have some benchmarks now for Metro so you can see what it looks like. RTX is at least starting to get implementations in games. We can't fault NVIDIA for that because we did fault NVIDIA for not implementing it in games previously. So they're moving in the right direction. RTX does provide some value sometimes. It's not enough quite yet, but it's clearly finally getting some spread. So we'll see how it develops. There's a lot more to look at here. We'll be back uh, not too long from now with more RTX content to kind of look at how it's advancing and if this is something that we need to pay more attention to for the future. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. We're probably going to have one more content piece on Metro here. It depends on how 
how drivers and things like that work out. But we might return with one more piece we have an idea on, so subscribe for that one. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up, for example, our brand new medium mod mat, which is at time of filming in stock, though they're selling quickly, so you might be on back order by, but uh, we'll get more in stock shortly. And that's it for this one. I'll see you all next time.